with Linda Blair, for example, I would simply find out the things she liked the most in life and the, thi and the time in her life that made her the unhappiest. And the time that made her the unhappiest was when her grandfather died. And she told me that. And I would very often just take her along. And you'll see some still photos in, in my book of me with my arm around her, just talking to her. And I had often talked to her about you know, the death of her grandfather to get her into a sad mood. And then the thing she liked the most was a chocolate milkshake. So when it came to having to do something in the film that she didn't feel comfortable about, she'd say, oh, I can't do that, Billy. And I'd say, oh, yes, you can. You can do it. Come on. And I'd say, she'd say, no. And I said, no milkshake today. No and she oh, come on. She was a child. And she didn't understand 95% of what she was doing in the film. But again, she was able to get through it through sense memory. And that is the strongest example of the tool, the best tool that a director has in eliciting a performance. The final stage of directing a film, the most important stage, is in the editing. That's where a film comes alive or dies. To me, all of the acting, all of the cinematography, all of the staging is nothing more than raw material for the cutting room. It's like taking notes for a book. And the notes aren't the book. The book is the book. The notes are simply raw material for the finished product. And that's what film is to me, raw material for the editing room. And in the editing room, that's where the true creative process of film is. You can make or break a film in the editing room with the way it's paced, with the takes that you use or don't use. You have to be brutal on the material that you shot and cut things that aren't working. You have to be able to recognize those things that aren't working. So the film only comes alive for me in the cutting room, and the film will literally talk to you as the director. You'll put two shots together. Now we do it in the computer. We used to splice them with mylar tape, one shot to another. Before that, we spliced them with glue, so, um, and which took forever. But now we do it on a computer. And I'll look at one shot going to the next. And Invariably, the, the two shots together will virtually scream at me and say, no, no, I'm not that. The, I am not that film. I am something else. And you'll, you'll get a palpable sensation from the way you put these shots together. And I go back and rework them and rework them until I no longer have the feeling that the film is resisting this method. And I, I've worked that way now, you know, over the last at least 40 years, and learned to just listen to the film. And as I say, all of the performances, even if I'm satisfied with them on the set, are simply raw material for that process. I'm going to, wow, I've spoken longer than I intended, but I will take some questions if there are any. But I, I simply want to end on a, on a brighter note and um, just tell you uh, the story, uh, a, a little joke about an actor. And this actor was playing uh, in what is perhaps the greatest play ever written in the English language, Hamlet. And every time he comes out on stage, the audience is booing him. And he, he, he's doing his part fine, so he thinks, but the audience boos him in every scene. The third act comes up, he makes his first 
appearance in the third act, and he's met by a chorus of boobs. And so he stops the play, and he walks down to the footlights, and he says to the audience, what do you want from me? I didn't write this shit. 